Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here, and in a spirit of solidarity with my colleagues this morning, I should let you know all of us are talking for the first time in public in a long time, so bear with us. Why are we talking about courage and design today? Cornelia Oberlander, who died earlier this year, long understood the threat that we now know as climate crisis, climate change. Since the IPCC first report in 1990, Oberlander was one of our strongest professional voices of alarm and confidence. She knew that design and planning mattered. In 2015, in a blog entry for DIRT, Designing Landscapes in the Changing Arctic, Oberlander is quoted as follows. We have to address climate change with great seriousness in all the work that we do and we must alter our designs and attitudes. The planet is finite, land is a resource. We must think about how to motivate people to understand this. I wanna focus on that issue, alter attitudes, as well as motivate people in my um, following remarks. We're talking about courage and design because the stakes are serious and the challenge is daunting. As Oberlander knew, our urban landscapes have to address the eco-technical problems of flooding and habitat loss, species decline, extreme weather, and prolonged drought. But they must do more than resist, adapt, and retreat. Our landscapes, the places we design, must motivate people. They must be affective as well as ecologically performative, and it takes a certain kind of courage to argue that design matters, that socio-aesthetic experience and affects matter when the Earth's temperature as well as the sea levels are rising. So in my brief introductory remarks, I'm going to make a plea for landscape architects to design immediate human experience as well as long-term community survival. immediate human experience as well as long-term community survival. I'm advocating for designed landscapes that support psychological well-being, social resilience, and political fortitude of our neighbors and our clients. They are our allies and our collaborators who not only care about global health, but they can take different kinds of actions if motivated to help solve our planetary crisis. They, our clients, the people who live and um, work and use the landscapes we design, they need effective experiences in the space of the parks, the streets, the piers, the public gardens uh, that they uh, walk through and interact with every day. For these, landscape experience might provoke a young activist's curiosity shift her friend's consciousness, inculcate a culture of care on the part of their children, and spark the, ima the imagination, the environmental imagination of their grandchildren. Yes, we need spatial and social justice. We need ecological performance, no question. But as Sarah Goldhagen wrote in her provocative New Republic essay several years ago, park here. We also need transformative, socio-aesthetic experiences in public space. So I want to argue that we need landscape architects like Cornelia and our speakers today with the courage to argue for more than the technical, to be brave about our roles as designers. We have a quarter century of humanities and science and technology scholars who have been arguing for our role. People like Larry Buell and Ulrich Beck have written that the environmental challenges require more than science and technology. We need a new climate crisis state of mind, new attitudes and new feelings that will emerge from art, from new images, from new narratives. And here I would argue spatial narratives, thinking of Julie's comments last night, material encounters. 
Artists have taken up this challenge too for several decades, so I'll toggle back and forth between scholars and artists in thinking about these issues. How can this be done? Think about artists like Alexis Rockman, who's been exploring climate change scenarios through speculative fictions and possible futures for over a decade now. Landscape architects are doing this too, and if you've talked to any students in grad school these days, they read speculative fiction as much as they read design journals. Why do scholars like Beck and Buell call for more than technical reports and policies? No surprise, they say that facts and reason do not easily change minds. For two decades, they've been calling for new immersive, everyday experiences of design nature as part of our climate crisis toolbox. They remind us that IPCC reports do not spur action. Artists like um, Eliasson have created installations and everyday experiences that evoke the sublime or terrible beauty of the atmospheric world in museums. What are the public space corollaries of this climate change tactic, the evocation of awe, of dissonance, of wonder? Scholars like Sheila Jasanoff have proposed the need for continual interaction and conversations between those in the sciences and other disciplines that are involved with meaning making, with interpretive sense making, like us. Here I think about the work of Ya Lu, his river village covered in snow, or autumn mist in the mountains, both from um, 2007, and the way that Lou deploys the power of discordant, uncanny representations of traditional Chinese landscapes through both material and digital manipulation of garbage and waste to create an experience of beauty and disgust, of dissonance akin to surrealist convulsive beauty. So too can landscape architects, as not only we've heard from Julie, but I think of Lisa Switkin and her inferences in her abstract to the term turbulent nature. Why else do these immediate landscape experiences matter? In his 2009 book, Giddens, the in the Politics of Climate Change, talks about the fundamental paradox um, that underscores our inability to address climate change. He's talking about the disconnect between what we know, the world is in trouble, and what we do every day. This uh, disconnect is related uh, to the invisibility of climate change uh, and the scalar disconnect between what we do and what we know. Artists are also exploring this disconnect, the scalar disconnect, um, the relational aesthetic disconnect. Uh, and here I think again about another project um, of Eliasson's, uh, his documentation of uh, glaciers melting in his uh, native Arctic and the way in which he literally transports that experience deploying relational aesthetics to bridge the scalar divide between processes far away and here the city streets of Paris. How else can we, as landscape architects, transform climate inaction and climate grief into landscape-specific relational aesthetics that connect the here and the there? How can we bring this back to landscape architecture? And what is the possible role that we have within a broad array of other cultural practices in art and literature? that are documenting the dangers, but also exploring the emotional responses to our changing climate. One of our profession's most knowledgeable experts who tweeted uh, yesterday um, about the power of her first teacher, Christina, I was talking about Julie. Um, Christina in her 2016 essay, Form Follows Flows, links the aesthetic and the ecological challenges of climate change to the recognition that adaptation is more than a technological uh, process. It's a social and emotional process as well. Hill, a geologist and a landscape ecologist as well as a landscape architect, 
describes our profession as having a hard time connecting form and spatial experience with urban ecological function and temporal dynamics. She recognizes that form matters in a climate change era, spatial experience matters, as they both can suggest these cross-scalar connections, and in doing so, evoke moods and emotions and feelings, perhaps prompting action. Hill connects effective experience with politics and with form. So what kinds of form and effective experiences are needed to create a social climate commensurate with today's crisis? When Buell, Giddens, Hill, Jasanoff, and Ulrich call for new collective experiences, new spatial and material practices, they are not imagining business as usual, more pleasing green spaces. That which is pleasing will not suffice. Their call, and that of others like de Bloch and Vicenzetti and um, Jola, beyond sustaining beauty, is for experiences that evoke awe, wonder, astonishment, and bewilderment. Cognitive scientists describe these conditions that may initially be unsettling, disruptive, and dissonant. They teach us that these feelings are more than individual or psychological. They're social, they're shared, and they're biophysical. Awe is literally in our bodies. These feelings perform, they're affective. In other words, awe is an affective experience. It's a biological aspect of emotion. It can drive us to care, to cultivate respect and attachment, to question our sense of self and our own interests, to be more generous and more compassionate, to give a damn. Cognitive scientists tell us that awe can be experienced in spaces that are constructed as well as in the wild, that it can be practiced Awe can be practiced as a shared lived experience of everyday routines. I think many of us were sustained over the last 18 months through those everyday experiences of awe as we walked. In doing so, our connections to not only each other, but other than humans and the planet can be cultivated. Awe might spark thought about multi-species codependence in the kind of work that Kate Orff does. It might spur adaptations and action that are commensurate to the climate crisis. I want to argue for everyday human experiences of awe, as well as science and policy. I've long been interested in awe and bewilderment and wonder as they relate to the experience in landscape. During the pandemic, there have been dozens of articles about the role of awe in evoking a sense of connection, gratitude, wonder, all of which can, can contribute to human psychological health and well-being. We need to be creating multi-scalar approaches to experiencing awe in the everyday through our material selections and constructions, through the landscapes we re refer to and transpose, through affective and immersive experiences, through courageous design. This takes designers with the courage to attend to the art and science of co-producing multi-species, climate-adaptive landscapes. Some of you, like me, might vividly remember the moment at the LAF gathering in 2016, where that sweet photo of Cornelia and a group of us was taken when it became clear to me that my colleagues most vocal about landscape form and landscape process were exploring the complexities of working between them. We were incredulous. Martha Schwartz and climate change? Jim Corner and beauty? He said that four-letter word. It was exhilarating for many of us as we saw two of the brightest and most talented practitioners incorporating new approaches and concerns. Now, they were not the first to be at the uncertain edge of design innovation, and I know you're rolling a little old dead Fred, but when new environmental concerns challenge normative aesthetic and formal practices, landscape architects are in the mix. Like Olmsted in the 1880s, I hope my, but particularly 
for those of you younger, your generation, will recognize that landscape architecture is much more than learning how to control floods and to create habitats. It is a socio-ecological and aesthetic practice that can affect and create affects. Olmsted described a park as a work of art that was designed to produce effects upon the minds of men, not a big place of trees and grass in the middle of the city. He was interested in those psychological effects. These effects can shift sensibilities, increasing the propensity to change, to care, and to act. So drawing on the writings of anthropologists and sociologists, eco-critics and the works of artists, on the already emerging practices of my colleagues, I'm arguing for artistic courage and uncanny and at times unsettling effective experiences. They're fundamental to the practice of landscape architecture uh, that's engaged with climate science. So to recap, there are two reasons why this type of courage is urgent. Scientific data and technological solutions are not adequate to persuade the public to adopt the consumption practices and lifestyle changes necessary to alter the trajectory and the pace of climate change. Second, most people cannot comprehend and then act on Giddens' paradox that there are direct connections between our everyday habits and climate change's invisible, intangible dangers to our collective human and other than human well-being and societal thriving. Over the next 90 minutes, I so look forward to hearing where courage resides within the varied practices of Lisa Switkin, Kate Orff, and Martha Schwartz, and the trajectories they are taking to address the climate crisis. These landscape architects are leading teams creating parks, plazas, shorelines, aquatic habitats that respond to and alter the impacts of the climate crisis on multi-species publics. They're creating memorable places and performative landscapes that audaciously address the uneven impacts of urban heat island effects, the contested shoreline edge between wet and dry, the loss of biodiversity and habitat. Through collaborative design, not just policy and legislation, they're engaging with the wicked problems of our time. And that takes courage. These designers work at the nexus of urban form, climate change, and socio-aesthetics. It takes courage on their part to insist that the form of the landscape, its material expression, and its experiential effects matter when the stakes for planetary survival are so high. It takes courage to be a designer in a public sphere full of scientists, ecosystem economists, policymakers, and politicians. It takes courage to invite those experts, as well as the residents of the places we design, to the table, to be co-designers, co-producers, and collaborators in the making and envisioning of landscape processes and patterns. I so look forward to our morning speakers who are courageously inserting landscape architecture at the nexus of a gnarly topic like climate crisis. When our three talks are done, I'll return to the stage to moderate a discussion with them. In the meantime, um, thanks so much for being here, for being patient with our um, nervousness and speaking in public. And I'm gonna pass the baton over to Martha.